Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat, an enthusiast podcast to the cultural phenomenon that is Miami Vice. My name's Dominic and join with me up in the greater Seattle area is my brother John and my sister in the San Francisco Bay Area, Jenna. And as normal, we like to kick off the episode talking a little bit about what's been going on in our lives. And I'm going to kick off this week. Normally, you know, we jump up to John up in the Seattle area, but I'm going to start off this week. Next Friday, I will be attending Phoenix Comic Con, which I have to say I'm kind of sad that I didn't get a chance to attend the Emerald City Comic Con while I lived in Seattle. But we have a ton of fun at the uh, at the Phoenix Comic Con. And I have a new baby, and we've been tossing around ideas for doing some sort of combo costume for, for us when we go to Comic Con. And considering that the three of us, John and Jenna, say hi. Hello. Hello. They are actually here. Watched Mad Max last night, the original Mad Max, and some costume ideas came to mind. Mainly from Beyond Thunderdome, the third Mad Max movie. The idea is, is that have the baby dressed up as Master Blaster, and I can be our bodyguard as we troll around through the sea of people at Comic Con. I think that you need to get Melissa on board with dressing like Tina Turner's character from that. Get her in the no. chain in the chainmail. <laughs> <laughs> get Demetrius uh. dressed as Max. Right, and then I'm Master Blaster, me and the baby are Master Blaster, Melissa's Tina Turner. Uh, and then I'm blanking out some other characters because I got one other kid. Mm. I don't think you're yeah, going to no, convince her to dress would, up like any of this. I, I think that would be fantastic. And uh, Demetrius could be road the road warrior. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's pretty obvious. It's I'm so hard to- for me because when I think about, like, I can't even mention Mad Max. I can't even say those two words without saying, like, okay, shut it down. I'm going upstairs. I'm going to go watch Fury Road. End of story. Like, good night. I just See, I love that movie so that, much. I'm actually surprised that you loved it as much as you did. I mean, I, I, I like it. It's a great movie. And it is a great remake of the classic. Like, they just knocked it out of the park when they did it. But um, it, I just, I, I'm surprised with, you know, normally you're very critical of <laughs> of stuff that's kind of outside your realm. So, <laughs> well, Speaking of Mad Max and Tina Turner, let's bridge that into this week's Miami Vice episode, which is titled Calderon's Return Part 2, or also known as Calderon's Demise. It's the, you know, here we kind of got a fix on how we've been calling our our episodes because we split the pilot into two episodes. So, so this is technically the fifth episode of the first season. It premiered on October 26, 1984. And so this is the second part to the hit list where there was a bounty put out on Crockett's head. And here we are now. They're going to go run down Calderon in the Bahamas. So let's uh, quit beating around the bush and jump right to the rundown on this episode. All right. So this opening is really unique in that it goes on forever. It takes them like 10 minutes to get through the opening to to the time we finish the credits and actually get into this episode. But this opening is amazing. And I loved how they did this. We start off with, they're still interrogating Mendez and in a very awkward shot where he's holding the glass and water is falling from out of the shot where it clearly looks like someone who is well hydrated is urinating into his glass. <laughs> right, that's my first note is, was someone peeing into the glass? <laughs> I'm genuinely they like jerk, confused. They smack it out of his hand before he even has a chance to drink it. See, at this part, the, the interrogation, starting with the interrogation, I'm thinking like, oh man, they're starting fast. Like, like we're going to get right into the episode. And then, and, and then 20 minutes of music montage later, we start the episode. <laughs> well, we're going to come back to that because I love this opening montage. What was interesting with the Mendez interrogation to me is that in the hit list last week, when they're asking him about, when they're trying to interrogate him about who the assassin is. Remember at the end of the episode, Tub grabs him when they find out that the assassin's not dead and that Linus had been killed. Tubbs comes running back into the interrogation room. He grabs Mendez by the shirt collar, throws him against the wall, and Mendez just yells out like, I ain't telling you shit. But then in this opening, Mendez is like, oh yeah, like Calderon's running coke on shrimp boats and is out of the Bahamas. And like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that becomes a theme in this episode where so, um, the characters we don't really care about tend to have a lot more information uh, <laughs> than you'd expect. You know, we they're interrogating him, and they find out that the hitman is supposed to kill him. Once he killed everyone on his list, he's going to go out to St. Andrews and wait and go talk to Calderon's men, and, you know, he'll have proof that he killed everyone, and then he'll collect his final payment. 
And the bombshell is, is that no one, none of Calderon's men or Calderon himself know who the, who, what the hit man looks like. So they can totally imp- try and impersonate him. So they decide that they're going to go travel to the Bahamas. Crockett is going to disguise himself as the hit man. And then they're going to go try and bring down Calderon. And then we get to what you're talking about, John. Probably my second favorite. I mean, you can't top in the air tonight montage, but this boat montage is great. They're all I loved this boat montage. I was so <laughs> yeah. I was so excited for it. <laughs> yeah. Sunny's hair blown in the wind. <laughs> so I had no idea that that this was coming. They just jumped to the boat and the music is playing and it's and the music just fits it perfectly and they're like just cruising in the open water. They're on Sunny's boat. So apparently the Bahamas, I don't know nothing about the Bahamas. Apparently you could just jump in your ski boat and cruise across the ocean to the Bahamas. Right, I was a little yeah, questionable on that because um, what the hell? Like, isn't that at least a few hours of a boat ride? Is that safe? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I mean, Golden Girls tells me that it's a fairly easy jaunt because they travel there frequently. So, <laughs> and if if Sophia Petrillo can make it to the Bahamas and back on like a regular cadence, then I think we're okay. Well, in this montage, right? They're like in the boat and the music's playing and it's like a helicopter above the boat and they're just like cruising. And it's like, it looks like one of the scenes, like when they're in Crockett's car and they're like cruising to go murder someone, right? Because that's what they do. Anytime mm-hmm. there's that montage, like someone's going to die. Right. It's the tubs looking yeah. longingly uh-huh. at Crockett as they as they focus, as he's like focused on the journey. And they're, they're traveling across the ocean and like Crockett's just, you know, he's the man behind the wheel on that boat. And this is the only funny part in this montage. Tubbs looks like he's scared out of his goddamn mind. <laughs> you can see he's like leaving finger grips on the windows as the boat's like bobbing through the ocean. And he's his mouth is moving like he's saying something. He almost looks like he's going like, ah, ah, as going across the ocean. <laughs> well, like as they zoom out and you see... They're, they're actually, they're really cutting it on that water. So oh, yeah. I would be freaked out because they're making, obviously, like with the shot, both of them are standing up and you can't feel secure, right? Like you're mm-hmm. chopping on the water and like that and you're standing far up. Out. Right. And they're pretty far out. And I don't know how much I would trust the drunk Crockett behind the wheel of this boat. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be pretty damn nervous too. Like I can't just swim to the beach anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs doesn't look like he's doing he's gonna go anywhere. He is just holding on for dear life. And I don't know if it's because maybe, you know, the actor playing Tubbs isn't, you know, he's not a fan of being out in the boat. Maybe it's that Don Johnson is really driving this boat out in the ocean while they film it from a helicopter and he's like, <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> Please, Jesus, help me! Who's <laughs> on this? Oh God! I think that that I think that that's what they did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm telling you. So that's... what what's great to me about this montage is that that it's one of the more iconic. This is actually one of the one of the scenes that they recreate in the movie that they made in like. 2009 or it maybe even uh later i think maybe even 2006 i can't I, I don't have it in front of me but uh so it's one of the main scenes in the show but man it goes on forever oh yeah it's really long it is and it, i i was thinking the same thing there's like are we like is this just like an MTV version of an episode? Like it's going to be a clip show and they're just going to run music in the background while Tubbs and Crockett look amazing cruising in this boat out the ocean. I would be totally okay with that. And and after five minutes of cruising in the ocean, they still felt it necessary to play the actual, the, the original opening credits afterwards. Mm -hmm. And and, they're quote unquote, the shortened version. Like it is slightly shorter bike, bike five seconds. Yeah. Like, was that necessary? Couldn't we have just let the montage be the open this time? Yeah, so they make it, you know, they, they get there. They they go through the montage. We get through the opening credits, and we actually finally kick off the episode at the docks in St. Andrews. Can I just ask? So you mentioned that obviously their plan for this is that uh, Crockett's going to impersonate the hitman, and it's going to be a way of getting to Calderon. But they Calderon and his people may not know what the hitman looks like, 
but they definitely know what Crockett looks like. Yeah. Like, he, he has been in the yeah. same space See, as Crockett and, on numerous occasions. So how did yeah, anybody and I was sign actually, off on that? I was going to wait until we got to the scene where he impersonates him, but I have the exact same note. Crockett's pretending to be a hitman uh, to the people that paid the hitman to kill him. Like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, so Calderon's guys should have been able to say, like, we want you to kill this man. Exactly. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. How does no one? Not, uh, how is this plan ever going to work? Yeah, they can't use either of them. Like Zito and Switek, who make no appearances, nor Gina or Trudy make any appearance in this episode. One of those teams mm-hmm. should have went in their place. Oh, They're going to recognize oh, both. Although Sunny I will note, and- I will note that Swite did for some reason get a credit in this episode, even they though he's not in Sw- it. They mentioned Switek a couple of times. Maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, enough to well, get his we, name in the we credits. Well, your character's name, so. <laughs> so I just, if, if we're gonna jump back for to when they first get to the hotel, I do want to talk about the very friendly bartender with an enormous amount of information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm so glad he you knows. He basically, up. he basically just explains the whole plot, so we don't have to bother with <laughs> any detective work. <laughs> yeah. And- and as the episode goes on, I'm like, what is this guy's actual job? Because he brings them food. He gets the, all of their connections. He's constantly yeah. offering them drugs. Yeah. He's a writer slash bartender slash whatever <laughs> I want to know, like, how big is this hotel that they're staying in? Because this dude does everything. Right. Like, you <laughs> I love see- the bartender, though. I love <laughs> that, the bartender because he makes it so that he makes it so that Everything we need to know about the episode, we know. Because he's the only one keeping this episode moving along. Mm-hmm. Oh, he comes in, a feeds device. them all the information, and then we have this uh, couple scenes will go by, and they'll come in and they'll feed them all the next information they need. He keeps this episode rolling along. So the, the, that guy, is the actor's name is Sam McMurray. Who has been in a ton of TV too? He was in Twenty One Jump Street, oh, yeah. Hill Street Blues, Buried with Children, Home Improvement. Like he is like TV, almost like TV royalty because he's been in so much TV. Yeah, I could. Yeah, he's one it. of those guys that have probably guest starred in like every sitcom ever made. Exactly. You know, he has played some bit character for some two episode premiere. Uh, I mean, two episode showcase, you know, mm-hmm. in like every show ever made. Yeah. And oh. he knows everything. Like they come up to talk to him and they're like, are you saying here? He's like, yeah, Miller. He's like, he immediately knew like, okay, yeah, I know you're in this hotel room. And they're like, do you know who this woman is? Like, oh yeah, that's Angelina. Who's like, you know, what, what, one of the main characters on Calderon's team in this, in this episode, like she works up at the school on the North side of the Island. She teaches fourth grade. Like he knows everything. Like, her <laughs> social security number is seven, one, four, six, nine. But her address is three, four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And then He's... he tells them that there's a, this festival going, going on called the Junkaroo festival. <laughs> the junk... Oh wait, I didn't, the I, didn't junkaroo. Catch that. I didn't catch that. That's what it was called. The Junkaroo. Uh, <laughs> I, it's, I... it's, it's gotta be in that writer's room. It's like, because the Junk Room Festival can't be a real festival, right? And they're no. like, the yeah. head writer's like, we gotta come up with a name for this festival. They're like, I don't know. How about the Junkaroo? They're like, no, no, find a better name. Then at the end of three days, like, I guess we're going with Junkaroo. No, it's seriously, it's gotta be that, like, <laughs> somebody just pr- forgot to, like, control, uh, find, and replace. <laughs> you know, like, they, that was just, like, a holder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they started reading it out when they're filming it. It's like, someone said that loud, right? It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's weird is that there are a number of festivals that go on like why would that have to be something that they made up like the bahamas and all of those islands throughout the caribbean have a number of festivals that go on that mirror what they what this festival looks like like the kind of hedonism sort of season that they go through mm-hmm. they have a ton of masquerade style uh festivals so why do they even need to come up with a fake one that doesn't make any sense to me. For legal purposes, we're going to call this <laughs> Junkaroo. <laughs> Isn't that more offensive than just coming up with? <laughs> the duo leaves from there after having, like, the most informative, like, okay, let me back up. Back up. So yes. The other show person up. that they've met that, that, that have given them a, as much information in the show is Noogie. And Noogie's, like, on the payroll now. This bartender <laughs> should yes. be on the payroll 
for the Miami Police Department. Oh, I expect Jimbo Walters to show up again. He better. <laughs> he needs a spinoff, okay? Like, the I deal- have to know what happens with his novel. <laughs> <laughs> the duo leaves from there, and they jump to the Bahama police I just station. want to know, is this weed really as good as he says? <laughs> hey, as far as you know, like, it is. <laughs> I mean, uh-huh. it must be because he seems like he's doing fine the mm-hmm. whole time. Clearly how he gets his connection. Well, after talking to the most informative person on the entire island, the duo goes to the Bahama police station or the St. Andrews police station, wh- whatever it is. Right. Crockett goes there. Tubbs yeah, Crockett goes, goes out. there. So, yeah, Tubbs goes out, on, quote on. unquote, fishing. I. I will sum up the uh, Crockett going to the St. Andrews Police Department really quickly. Every TV show, American history, and every movie, we have a very, I, I find we have a very low opinion of everybody else in the world's police department. Like, they are always insanely corrupt and insanely co- incompetent. And so, basically, this meeting between Rocket and the St. Andrews Police Department just reiterates the fact that St. Andrews PD is either very corrupt or completely incompetent at what they do. Yeah, which is funny coming from Sonny Crockett, who the Miami Police Department find out are too late to stop any murder and then murder everyone who they think is involved with it. Right. Yes. And he's yeah. awfully cocky so now in let's... this in, when he goes in there and he's talking with them where he's like, hold on, hold on. Let me just tell you everything. And Sonny tells the police captain there, who's like, hey, we, we can't help you. There's, you know, we don't know any information right now. They, we go to, he tells him like that Tubbs has gone quote unquote fishing. And we jump to Angelina. She's out on the beach and she's painting out on the beach. And Tubbs comes walking up. With the hairiest stomach I have ever seen. Somebody please sure make, him, <laughs> make him button up. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Angelina's there painting, right? And you see in the background, Tubbs come, come walking up and you see his shirt's unbuttoned. He's got no shoes on. You're like, oh my God, he's going to try and seduce her. You just see it from a distance. <laughs> that's, that's the exact thought process. Okay. Yeah. And the, the, what I, the whole thing I was thinking at the start of this scene is she is clearly somewhere that's kind of away from everybody, pri- privately mm-hmm. painting, you know? And we find out later in the scene that Calderon's out on the boat all, off the edge of this beach. And so it just seems really random. All of a sudden, this guy just walks up out of nowhere, a complete stranger. is like, hey, how you doing? Good looking? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's so Rico, isn't it? Like, he's always yeah. super rapey in every scene. But yeah, then it is incredibly it. stalkerish. <laughs> he's got his, like, his unbuttoned shirt. He's sweating. <laughs> 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 so he comes walking up to her like, hey, that looks like it's cubism or whatever. Like, he tries to throw out like he's some art dealer or, or something. And it's just yeah. super, super creepy. And this scene is a lot what- like the bartender scene where we get that without leaving that beach you find out you find out her name's angelina then they see on the boat that calderon that you know so she's painting the ocean like a yacht out on the ocean and they and then crockett somehow magically appears there pre-cell phone era no gps they somehow find each other out on this beach and angelina And they uh, so let's they see in the binoculars that it's calderon's boat that calderon's out on the boat yeah let's just recap this here they have been in st angelina for roughly one hour, they have already figured out where Calderon is, who this Angelina is, why they're there. You know, it, it is just and just through dumb luck. Like mm-hmm. no detective work has been done at any point. They have not run down any leads. This is all because they met a very friendly bartender and happened to take a walk on the beach. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay, so. They're talking, and they find out that it's Calderon's boat, right? And I just want to point out, because it becomes more notable as his feelings are so quickly escalated later, but Rico calls Angelina an overeducated hooker, okay? (laughs) So I just want to put a pin in that, because he's, like, totally after her at the end of it, and clearly is. we have a whole montage of him thinking fondly on her. So Mm -hmm. that just seems to be a little... A little rough 
I was a little taken aback. I think this scene, you know, it, it's one of the more important scenes in the in this episode, right? Because you see who Angelina is. You see that she's a, somehow affiliated with Calderon. You see that Tubbs is going the route. Clearly that he's not going to try and do any investigations. He's just going to try and get the information out of her by seducing her. But the other thing is, is that I want to talk about like norm this show, as we know now, they don't do a very good job at doing the the little things that well. So you look at like uh, the where she's out there painting, and you look at what she's painting. It looks like like a kindergartner's finger painting that she's doing <laughs> on this canvas. <laughs> and they keep they keep showing like the angle of her messing with the painting, and she's just like she's just like swatting at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's, she's like staring out into the ocean, looking right. at this boat, and you look at what she's painting. You're like, what the fuck is that? It doesn't look anything like what you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she is clearly uncomfortable with Tubbs throwing throwing his game at her. Yeah, like she's yeah. she like the whole time is like, um, I, I I've got to go. Um, excuse me. Um, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> after we find out all this information, so we move real quickly to find out all this information. They get to the they get to St. Andrews. They find out everything they know the entire island's history from Joe the bartender. <laughs> they get to. Which, they by the way, do you guys want to get high? You want to get high? Because um, I, I can get you a joint. And, yeah. You know, we, we can get high. They find <laughs> Angelina, like, really fast. They find out that she's affiliated with Calderon. Where they've barely been on the island for, like, 15 minutes. You know, they find all this out. We jump from there. We go to the hotel. We finally get to the hotel. And Crockett's working out. It's, like, the next morning, I think, is what it's supposed to be. So Crockett's doing some push-ups. Tubbs tosses him the paper. And they see that there's a planted story in the Miami Herald about uh Crockett being killed so they're trying you know patch up that story so that it makes sense that the assassin's there to collect his money even though he looks exactly like one of the people he's supposed to kill <laughs> right yes yeah the, there's a news story in the paper about how Crockett's dead so that they won't recognize Crockett when he shows up to get paid for killing Crockett yeah I really hope that they used a photo in that newspaper article <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like Crockett and Tubbs shaking hands or something. Yeah. <laughs> a picture of them on the speedboat. Right. Yeah. With Tubbs just like, ah! it's, it's actually what was taken shortly before they left, and they're on the Chris Craft stinger. So they, they look at the story. Oh, wait, and wait, they, wait, 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 wait. Hey, hold on, he's, hold on. He's, just really he's quick. Survived, just... He's survived by his, uh, his pet alligator, Elvis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hold on, really quick, really quick. I just want to throw this out there. Why did they take the speedboat to St. Andrews and rent a hotel room? Doesn't yeah. t- uh, Crockett live on a boat? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he can't he just take his to. home? <laughs> yeah, couldn't he just take his home to St. Andrews and then they wouldn't have to have the hotel room? <laughs> I guess the I mean, I guess they wouldn't do that. It, yeah, and I guess they wouldn't have met the informative bartender. And that's so. Speaking of the bartender, he makes an appearance again. He just suddenly shows up as like he's delivering their room service, and you start to wonder, like, what does this guy do? What is he for yes. this hotel? Like, because what, he's what the bartender, the and he also handled check-in now, and now he's delivering room service, and while he's there. He, the guys he's look at eating the food. It. Yeah, the guys look at the food like, oh, he's like, oh, you're not going to eat that? Can I eat your toast? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh-huh. And what's great about this bartender is yeah. like, dude, like, if he, I hope he's a real, he sounds like he's a real pothead and this isn't acting that he's, because he's trying to sell him wheat. He's like, yeah, I do everything. Like, it's cool. I got no problem with it. He's probably got no shoes on. You know, when he's up there delivering their room service, he asks him if he could just eat their food. And then he tells him about the book that he's writing. That he's written over 2,100 yes. pages of a book that's like a cross between the Mutiny on the Bounty and the Road Warrior. Right. Like, <laughs> I, yes. I, just, I hope so much that that actually exists as like fan fiction out there somewhere that somebody's taken it upon themselves to just write yeah. this. Because I, I want to read, read that, that book. Oh, my God. At this Absolutely. point, at this point in the episode... I just want to stay with Jimbo and listen to him talk about this novel. Like, I don't care anymore about Calderon. Tell me more about the Road Warrior novel. <laughs> and this, so we started off with talking about Mad Max at the, at the beginning of, uh, of our podcast. And there's so much crossover 
now into this episode because of the there's a Tina Turner song later in the episode. He's talking about the Road Warrior. Like, is Mad Max, is that like some Illuminati thing that's happening here where Mad Max is part of the Miami Vice world? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's got to be some kind of connection because it, it, it can't be random that we watched Mad Max last night. And then yeah. there's so many connections with this episode for this week's podcast. Before the end of the scene, Crockett gets a note that the bartender has in his pocket, like all crumbled up in his pocket. Jimbo's like, oh, yeah, by the way, mouthful of toast. Like, here you go. You also got this note, too. And it's from Cal. It's that he's got to go yeah. meet Cal- Cal- Calderon's man in two hours. Tubbs takes off. He's going to go talk to Angelina again because she had dropped a watch at the beach. She's going to go bring that back to her where they decide that they're going to go have dinner, too. Then we go to the scene Wait, where and Crockett what, what is going to What kind of go, watch is that? Is that like a Disney watch or something? I have a feeling it's a lot like the watch we bought while we were in Mexico, John, where it says <laughs> it says Rolex on it. But, it you know, it's made Rolex of plastic. Rolex two L's. Yeah. Now we get to like one of the best scenes, right? Crockett is there. He's going to go meet with Calderon's men and collect Mm -hmm. the payment on the, uh, uh, as being the assassin. Calderon's men are there. He's, is like, you know, five or six of Calderon's men are there and Crockett's there to collect on the money. His only proof that he killed, that he killed himself is an obituary in the Miami Herald, right? Which they just totally buy. They go, they're going to pay him 60000 And then Crockett proceeds to say, no, no, no. Killing myself was way more difficult than I thought it was going to be. So therefore, because myself is so great, you owe me more money for killing myself. I was like, man, Sonny thinks really highly of himself. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's a hell of a negotiation tactic. Hey, yeah, no, no, I want an extra thirty grand, um, mm-hmm. even though I've already killed him. And at this point, you can just tell me to f off. Yeah, but no, I want an extra thirty grand, and I want Calderon himself to deliver it. Which yeah, the, it doesn't, you know, and it's supposed it's a guy that Calderon will recognize. Like if that meeting did happen. Calderon would get out of the car, see him go, oh my God, that's Sonny Crockett. We were supposed to murder him. Why is he here? Yes. And, and not only that, but it's only leverage in this whole give me an extra 30 grand and make sure Calderon, Calderon hand delivers it or else I will kill Calderon. Wait a minute. So you want Calderon to show up with an extra 30 grand or you're going to kill him. So why would he show up with an extra 30 grand? Why would he go anywhere near you? (laughs) You you take your logic right out of this episode, John, okay? (laughs) I don't know. I'm going to go smoke pot with Jimbo. (laughs) Uh, I'm going back. I'm going to go get high with Jimbo while while Crockett tries to figure out this logic. (laughs) Yeah, because Jimbo's got some dirt on everyone on that island. So if you want to bring exactly. anyone Jimbo's else Jimbo's in there, the no. Jimbo knows things. When that scene ends, we have a quick jump to Calderon's boat where you see Angelina's on the boat with Calderon. And Calderon finds out that Crockett's asking for another 30 grand. And Angelina's like in a far off like dreaming about tubs, apparently. We jump from there straight yeah, to and I- Crockett and Tubbs. They're cruising down the road and Crockett's telling Tubbs. They're having a conversation kind of like uh, about Angelina, right? Like, and Tubbs is starting to admit, like, that you're starting to see cracks in it that he actually is starting to feel for her. Right. Yeah. And it was kind of, he's kind of back and forth on it, too. Cause at one point, it almost sounds like he's trying to, to justify that, oh, uh, I don't think she likes me, you know? Like, I don't think my stalkerish charm is working, mm-hmm. kind of thing. But it's mostly just him being defensive that, oh, I, you know, that he's not falling in love with her after, you know, 30 minutes of talking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, she her paintings just took him away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was either that or he's kind of got this, like, weird, maybe boyish fantasy with her because... I, I I just I don't get it. I don't know. Maybe Angelina is worth it, but I, I just couldn't understand his like zero to sixty mentality, but he bothered me this whole episode. And, so Yeah, and when he gave her the watch back, when he gave her the watch back and like tried to get the dinner date, I, it felt very much like, Hey, come with me and check out my van without windows type <laughs> pitch. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. This scene, you know, and this is what I think what I love about Miami Vice is that we talked about last week where, you know, you can have 
it's a show where you can be in and out and as long as you pay attention to the beginning of the end you you get you fully understand what happened oh this episode especially yeah, yeah to, especially the end of this one yeah. <laughs> so this scene you know this scene is is a great the in-between stuff is where the great stuff happens, right? Where the awkward conversations, the bad effects, you know, the all that kind of stuff happens. And this scene is no exception. They're cruising down the road yes. and the <laughs> this truck comes pulling up. There's like a bunch of partiers for the Junkaroo that go driving by, right? <laughs> and then a car pulls up behind that truck and it's got four guys inside of it. And then they Crockett sees a gun. And the it, gun, they start shooting at it, but we go into, into a, a chase. random car chase. Yeah, but yeah. It's like it just breaks speed. out into a random car chase. But it's like a slow speed car chase. And what's hilarious to me is that they're like, whoa, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, just well, it doesn't so help that they're fancy. driving like the biggest boats of cars. They're driving like Oldsmobiles, <laughs> you know, or like. Buick Park Avenues, you know, and so they're going like 25 um, on an island, through town, right? On an island, this eventually, like, you can't drive forever. Eventually, you're going to get caught, right? And yeah, th- this scene. They so last week in the hit list, there's a great and normally in all the episodes we watched so far, my advice, the car chase scenes are fantastic. And last week was no exception. They have the car chase scene in the beginning where the assassin murders the murder zone and then they jump into the Camaro and some other police chase them th- through the city and they're hauling ass and it's a great. This one is comical at best because you're right. They're like, it's like yelling out like, oh my God. Right. <laughs> Right. And then it I kept with, waiting for like the I kept waiting for like for like a guy with a cart with fruit on it to like walk <laughs> out. Into the, yeah. yeah, they like demolish every road that they drive down, and it ends with Crockett saying, "I'm gonna park this thing," and she drives it off the dock into the ocean, and then a few seconds later, it explodes. <laughs> <laughs> and then when yes. it's after it, it explodes, the car is gone. It just disappeared. The explosion caused a steel car to vaporize in the ocean. It just totally, yes. and it, it, like the parts don't go anywhere. The guys just get out of the car. And they're just like leaning on, like the guys that were chasing were just like leaning on the car, like. Hmm, all right, guess our work is done here. The car, the, <laughs> yeah. well, and, the car and at what point? Forever. At what point do they not just have to wait for them to swim out of the vehicle and then shoot them? <laughs> but but out of what vehicle? Because the car goes completely missing. Like it explodes, and there is no more sign that a car ever existed in the water. Well, until they get them out of the water, and then you can see parts of the car like being yeah. resurrected from the water and which... yeah. you know and, I, and thank god you know cars nowadays don't explode when they're submerged with water <laughs> right um because that was a horrible problem with those cars back in the 80s <laughs> you know a heavy rain and they would just explode yeah. the oh man you know when they the car explodes and it just totally di- disappears they, and like you're saying like the bad guys assume that they're dead, and that means that for the second time in this episode, Sonny has faked his own death. <laughs> <laughs> he's just so good at it. I mean, that's got to yes. be what the plan was, right? That's why he said, we're going to park this thing. Sonny's it's because he Sonny's thought done. ahead, like, well, the only way they're going to stop chasing us is if they think I'm dead again. So the I'm old- going to yes. do I'm gonna, like there's no way he thought about this ahead at, of time like this is a great idea and at no point at no point does does Tubbs ever or anyone ever point out the fact that this is all Crockett's fault right yeah. not shown up to a meeting <laughs> pretending to be a guy who killed himself <laughs> they would have never known they were even on the island Okay. Well, now they don't think that they're on the island anymore because clearly Crockett and Tubbs are dead. And when they're yes. they're doing the debriefing with the local police, the the local the, Which, the police the captain way. says like, "Hey, we saw the boat fueling off of San Marcos. It could be anywhere out in the ocean. We have no idea." And Cro- Crockett pulls Tubbs aside and's like, "Hey, I think our our uh, the police captain is crooked." Because he's the only one that knows that we would be police, and that's the only reason why Calderon's men would try and kill us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Aside yes, from the fact not that, that they would recognize earlier, me when I show up to the meeting. Yeah, or like 15 minutes earlier when Crockett said, give me $30,000 more or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> that's not yes. a reason to, <laughs> for them to try and kill Crockett again either. 
I will tell you that the no, only it's... majorly disappointing thing about this episode for me is that Crockett is in white pants. He gets out of the water and he is wet. And they don't give me the appropriate <laughs> amount of screen time for that. <laughs> like, come on. It's a beach show. They are near, like, in and around water all the time. I finally get the one chance that he's in the white pants and he's in the water. And I don't get anything out of it. That's horrible. I, I want to point fires. out something, too. We've we we've talked about this before, but they are, are sitting there talking to the St. Andrews Police Department. Ambulance <clears throat> sitting there. Everyone's right there on the dock where they drove a car into the water. Clearly, they are not dead, and they are very publicly once again sitting talking to the cops. But it doesn't no, matter. They're supposed to it be. doesn't matter on this island. There's no local uh, journalist. <laughs> Jimbo, the bartender, is the only <laughs> one that collects all the information. And he wasn't there, so they're safe. Jimbo was at the hotel, so no one will ever know that they No one will ever death. know. I just, I just wish, okay, like, maybe, okay. we should go, maybe we should go back and rewatch and just slow frame it in the background and see where Jimbo's hanging out around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> just watch this go down. Okay, all right. All right. My head... At this point, my head hurts. Let's just get to the awful, awful sex scene. Yes, yes. So we, we leave from there, and Crockett says that he's, you know, uh, I forget what he's going to go do, but Tubbs says he's going to go talk to Angelina again to find out what's going on. I think Crockett says that he's going to start getting ready to leave, right? Right. And Tubbs says he's going to go talk to a a Angelina again to see if he can find out. And he shows up to Angelina's house, and Angelina's just getting Let, out of the let's shower. Let's just be serious. Crockett's going to go try and screw up this plan <laughs> even yeah. more than he already has. <laughs> yeah. And Tubbs and is going to go try and get laid before Crockett can screw it up even more than he already has. Yeah. And Tubbs, <laughs> you know, he... There's an exchange before he disappears, but I mean, be, be, before he leaves from Crockett, where Crockett's like telling him, like, hey, you know, like, don't get too attached. And like, sure, you're just going over there to investigate. Like, we both know what you're going there for. Knocks on the door. Angelina comes to the door in a towel, opens up the door, and Tubbs just lets himself in. And you immediately know, like, oh, yeah, this whole scene is about them boning down. That's I the mean, only thing that they're going to do in this scene. Oh, yeah. So Tubbs is clearly uh, taken like the what's your sexual style quiz. And his is <laughs> Matador because they, they, they just awkwardly <laughs> spin in circles for like three minutes before they kiss. It was it was I like, what was that? Where they uh, were just like walking and staring each other down. All right, Jenna, we're going to give you a moment here. In all the episodes, you know, the Sonny and Rico, they have, you know, love, quote unquote, love interactions. But up to this point, it's only been Sonny, who you, we both know, you have the hots for. Now we're finally, we're to our first Rico Tubbs sex scene. Give us a rundown from a female perspective on the Rico Tubbs sex scene. The TLDR of it, okay? Fire your writers. Take Rico. Never do this ever again. Okay, it was horrible. <laughs> I'm damaged. I'm gonna have to like, <laughs> like seek help to try and get past this. So first they do their little matador dance, right? Because that's what gets every woman turned on is to <laughs> circle her like she's your prey. So then they kiss, and you think, oh, okay, well, it's a kiss. Like, you can't really fuck that up, right? Apparently you can, because he, like, half swallows her face. And, <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, you have to imagine that the people who are recording this episode, like, the videographer is like, okay, guys, we've got to fix this. Something, we, we can't, we can't, we got to zoom out or do something else, right? So they go into the whole, like, lovemaking scene, and it goes super transparent. I'm, like, nine music video inspirational poster montage like <laughs> if anyone's ever karaoke they have like those weird someone yeah. made it on their own video camera walking on the beach kind of music videos that play along uh, it that looks show you like, the words yeah, it looks like, just like, like it's, that it, it like looks the screensaver like, they run behind you with, exactly. with, while the lyrics are dropping or like yes. one of those 90s where you could call like 80s 90s where you could call in and buy a, a tape or a cd of the greatest hits of, ni of the 1980s like it's yes. the greatest love hits and it shows like a couple walking slowly uh, on the beach uh, and text is scrolling by of like all the love songs from 1987 
Right, like, I'm expecting Bridge Over Troubled Water to start playing in, like, <laughs> slow-mo or something, but it wasn't even, uh, so they didn't even do, like, um like that traditional 80s where they, they like, layer the image, and it want, like the one's just more transparent. I mean, obviously, that's what they were going for, but they had to go extra. That's got to be, like, maybe 20% opacity, okay? Because they were like, <laughs> we, we can't commit to any more than that. He's got that horrible hairy chest. He's so it, sweaty. It Nobody kind of wants felt, to see this. It kind of felt like... <clears throat> ID med commercial, you know, like a Cialis commercial. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, like there should be a warning be at ready. the end. If, if you have an erection for more than four hours, <laughs> please call Miami PD. <laughs> it was well, traumatizing. I hope that they never let Rico get laid on this show ever again. According to my inside sources from the super fandom, this is the tamest tub sex scene. That's we have more to look forward to. And at the end of this sex scene, when they're just laying in bed and Angelina's running her fingers through Tubbs' chest hair. <laughs> it's not even his chest. She's, she's like circling the curls in the middle of his stomach. <laughs> we find out. I bet that- you it smells like coconut oil and ass in that room. <laughs> Find out after all the lovemaking that Angelina is not actually Calderon's girlfriend, that she's his daughter. Awkward. Ju- yeah. And yeah. invites Tubbs <clears throat> to a, a masquerade party that's happening that night. It, Tubbs drops the great line. He's like, oh, great. I love masquerades. <laughs> because he spits so much game (laughs) god you know what you hang around sunny so much how could you not like he's just tangentially like pick it up right because sunny Mm -hmm. sunny's so suave he's got he's got so much game quick side note here quick side note as far as the whole revenge front for Tubbs getting back for killing his brother going down a pretty good road here he's already banged his daughter (laughs) so um (laughs) He, he he he's winning on the revenge side of things, you know. But mm-hmm. um, how old is Calderon actually? Because yeah. uh, does this mean that his daughter's like sixteen, seventeen? Like like should we be concerned at this yeah. point? <laughs> and we know, you know, reading afterwards that they artificially made Calderon look older than he did just yes. four episodes ago. Four episodes ago, he didn't have any gray hair. In this episode, they did because it didn't make any sense him being a young man or younger man in the in the pilot episode, and now being an older man with a with a you know, what's what I hope is a twenty something daughter. Right. Yes. So they had to artificially make him older, and they did. They gave him gray hair, and they like he looked older. And it's not like there's a season that happened in between here. No, it's just five episodes, just five weeks. Since yes. this happened, since the pilot, we're now to an older Calderon. Like he's got, like he's got a Benjamin Button or something. <laughs> yeah. When this scene ends, we go back to the boat, and Tubbs is telling Crockett he's given a rundown, like all this stuff. There's a masquerade party that Angelina is his daughter, and they're quickly setting up, like they're loading up the boat to make it look like they're leaving, and then they like do a switcheroo and they head back to the hotel. This is and Jim Bob yeah. makes an, another appearance. Jim Bob comes up and hold on, so, hold on. And so, Tubbs yeah. also. This is when Tubbs tells Sonny that I know I only met her about twelve hours ago, but I love her, man. Yeah, yeah. Tubbs is like head over heels now. He's totally in love with Angelina and Jimbo, who we know now. Who he's the front desk. That's where the that's where our team, our crime fighting duo, checked in. He's serving drinks at the bar. He delivers room service, and now he brings them costumes for the masquerade party. Seriously, this guy is giving Noogie a run for his money for the most helpful informant for the Miami Police yeah. Department. Yeah, I'm telling you, at this point, it should just let Jimbo handcuff uh, Calderon and just end the episode. Yeah. Jimbo's on it, man. What's weird to me, though, is that the mask that he holds up, that Rico holds up, it's like a straight up dollar store or like Party America Halloween mask. And then yeah. you jump to the masquerade and they're in like like Day of the Dead school. Yeah, mask? they totally – we leave from there. We It jumps forward a couple <clears throat> of hours and we go to the Junkaroo Masquerade Festival that's happening. <laughs> oh, and they okay. clearly took the mask that Jimbo brought them and threw them straight in the trash can. Because <laughs> right. they're not wearing the yeah. ones that Jimbo the pothead brought them. They went out <laughs> – the masks that they're wearing almost look like Lucha Libre masks that they're wearing. Yeah. Oh, 
God, that would have been so much better. <laughs> like, like, pull over the head. <laughs> yeah. Mask. Junkaroo Masquerade Party doesn't last very long. We, uh, they see Angela fast. Tubbs and, An- and, and, not Angela, Angelina. They go, they dance, very awkward dances. It moves along really fast. And then, like, within just a couple seconds, we see that Calderon's men and the captain of the St. Andrews Police Department have got Sonny at uh, gunpoint, and they're putting him onto a boat, and they're taking him away. Someone tries to grab Tubbs, but he smashes a bottle over his head, and him and Angelina r- run away. So now Calderon's men and the captain of the police, who's clearly dirty, like we kn- like they alluded to earlier in the episode, they've captured Sonny, mm-hmm. and Tubbs and Angelina have gotten away. And this is this is probably one of my this is one of my favorite scene of the episode we've laughed a lot about other stuff but it's so bad they, like we, can we get tommy was so on set because i feel <laughs> like that's what was needed for me because they're just like they're not quite acting so much as just screaming and trying to get louder than the last yeah we, they go to a separate part of the beach and Tubbs is going to tell angelina like your dad is a criminal he murders people and she's like denying, like, no, he's not. You're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about because he's been hiding it from her all these years. Them just screaming at each other, escal- like, louder and louder with each exchange. And I have like, was something loud happening in the background that we don't know about? That, that, that <laughs> right. makes so they can't hear each other. <laughs> like, I, I kept expecting like a like a speedboat or a helicopter, or, like something <laughs> yeah. that would cause them to be like, I can't hear you. Your father's a murderer. <laughs> yeah, she's like, no, he's not. I don't know what you're talking about Tubbs is like yes he is he killed my brother and it's like is this this sounds like a broken hearing aid conversation that's happening between these two it was yeah. it, it was so awkward and I have no idea how that transitioned into like now take me to your father because they kind of leave it a little yeah that's, where that's just, what like, bothered me about it that, that's what bothered me about it is how does this conversation end with Angela taking Tubbs to her father's secret hideout where mm-hmm. they're planning on killing Sonny. Like, mm-hmm. like at what point does telling Angela, I'm, I only banged you so I could get revenge on your dad for killing my brother equal, but by the way, well, I then I better you know. take you. <laughs> it was all a mistake. Yeah. I'm madly in love with you now. I can't wait for your it, you know, birthday. It, it just, shows you, just shows you how naive high school girls really are. This would make one <laughs> hell of a YA novel. I'll tell you that much. Well, let's get to the final scene. Well, second to last. This is the last scene of the actual episode. Then we have how, how the episode ends, which is fantastic. We come to Calderon's yes. mansion. Sonny's there in handcuffs. They got him at gunpoint. Calderon is eating. He's explaining. He's doing the bad guy thing where he's doing a rundown on why he's so powerful. It's like a Scarface moment, right? He's giving Sonny a rundown it's, on why he'll the, never get killed. I call it the, the Bond villain. It's the Bond villain. I explain to you how we're going to kill you and... Mm-hmm. This is my evil plan, and mm-hmm. hopefully at no point before I finish telling you all this, no one storms in and saves you. And that's exactly what happens, right? Angelina pops in around the corner. Well, sorry, Calderon, one of Cal- Cal- Calderon's men tells him that Tubbs didn't get killed, that he got away. He So Calderon turns and smashes this guy with a glass in the face, and Angelina pops around Stupido. the corner. Idiota. <laughs> yeah. I don't know any oh. other words in Spanish, but I think that that's right. Angelina pops around the corner and is like, Dad, like she finally sees that who he is, and he's like, he's totally thrown off. They're like, what are you doing here? And then Tubbs pops around the corner with the machine gun, and it becomes like, for some reason, Angelina didn't know that he was going to do that. So she's like arguing with him, with, with her dad and with Tubbs, you know, like, don't do this. This is a now, bad well, idea. At what point from the argument on their beach? Did Tubbs and Angelina stop and Tubbs pick up a machine gun and then they <laughs> continued on to their her father's house? Yeah. Well, and then they clearly parted ways because she comes in from the stairs and he comes in from the other side. Mm-hmm. Or did mm-hmm. nobody notice that he just that he just walked down the stairs and across the way? Yeah. And then like yeah. hid behind the I think, other wall. I think Tubbs had convinced Angela this is gonna be a murder suicide. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna take out your dad and then we can together for all eternity yeah they like uh natural born killers it at the end here <laughs> so we have the tubs pops out he's got his gun every shootout we've had in this show like the car chases have been amazing but this shootout is like the lamest shootout that i've ever, ever watched on tv so one of the bodyguards yeah. tries to shoot tubs crockett punches him takes his gun beats the fuck out of him right another guy fires mm-hmm. 
and so at this point, Tubbs and Calderon kind of take two steps to the left, and they do like they like break the the fourth dimension where they like just appear on the other side of the wall, and it's got to be like there's two like they walk out onto like a balcony, right? And they're gonna have like a duel, mm-hmm. so it's set up like. Tubbs is going to get his revenge. They're going to have a duel. One of Keldon's men tries to shoot Tubbs. Tubbs turns and shoots him. Bang! Kills the bodyguard. But by the time he turns around, Caldone's got a handgun out. And it looks like this is it. Caldone's actually going to kill both. He's going to kill Rico. And he already killed his brother. This is it. And Sonny shoots and kills Calderon. And the whole thing was like done in this really bad slow-mo. That's only really like three shots fired. And then when Calderon gets hit, he falls and his head goes backwards into the pool. And I'm thinking the whole time, like, oh, my God, there must be so much water up his nose right now. <laughs> but, but not before he falls. Like, he, the, the, the dummy or whatever they're using for him, I really hope that that's not what the actual actor looked like. But, like, falls on his ass and he's sitting there in this, like defunct pose where he's like mm-hmm. leaning forward before he's like oh and then throw myself backward into the water <laughs> yeah. and he, his head goes uh, underwater and then when they they go to sunny or they go to uh tubs and angelina where she's screaming like no dad no and they go back to him and his head is clearly being propped up on top of the water that way he doesn't have to have water going <laughs> up his nose anymore <laughs> i mean it doesn't matter because you're so distracted by angelina just like yeah uh, okay we get it no okay uh yeah. no and then it's like someone on and like just always yells. and like always no one is ever arrested in this show uh, no, no one is them. ever arrested everyone is just murdered just mm-hmm. in cold blood just murdered and, and now they're like, murdering people in different countries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's like someone on set just yelled, and scene. And they just cut it off right there. Like it's done. Like that, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And we we come to there's like an investigation happening then like it's in the middle of the they night or the next it. morning, maybe. So in the middle of the night, the next morning, you know, we we come to where I can run some of this episode. Playing in the background is Tina Turner's What's Love Got to Do With It. And I forgot to mention earlier the name of the song that's playing in the opening montage, which is Voices by Russ Ballard. We got more information in a minute. Tubbs and Crockett, they're, you know, they're getting ready to start heading back. And Tubbs goes to talk to to Angelina. And Angelina is telling, I'm sorry, Tubbs is telling Angelina that finally telling her that, hey, I'm a cop and she don't give a fuck. She's like, whatever. That's cool. You killed my dad. That doesn't make anything you know that that doesn't justify this but most importantly in this scene where we close out the episode we get another boat montage to close out the episode with what's love got to do with it blaring over this over this boat montage the difference this time is that we get a full rundown of the entire Calderon story arc in montage form with Tina Turner playing in the background. Yes, and the montage is so long that they actually play like the entire song. Yeah, yeah, and it's every, it's like, we see Rico's brother get killed again. We see all the stuff from the pilot episode. We see a recap of the episode we just watched, which is one of my favorite things we've talked about before that we are fans of bad movies, that we have a dedicated movie, bad movie night. On Saturday nights, we specifically go out and watch bad movies. And when, one of my favorite eras of bad movies is the late 80s. And the late and the mid to late 80s, they had this amazing thing where at the end of a movie, they did a rap song while it ran over the credits while the rap song talked about what happened in the movie you just watched. And that's one of my favorite things yes. of all time in movie history. And this episode did it. They have a Tina Turner song playing and they do a montage of the same shit you just watched. You just watched all this happen. We clearly yes. ran out. Of, we ha- we needed to fill another five minutes worth of film. <clears throat> Let's do a montage of the thing you just watched. Right. I felt yes. really cheated. The recap I had this- montage. Yeah, because I had to sit through like 42 minutes of or so of this episode, and then it basically recapped in the whole last three minutes, and it just felt like, well, I probably could have gotten all of it if I yeah. just skipped to the very end. And I got an awesome yeah, Tina and be Turner honest song with you, out of it. Yeah, to be honest with you, I kind of enjoyed that Tina Turner uh, song, and uh, I would have rather just watched the montage and just skip <laughs> to the next episode. <laughs> I would have missed the lovely Jimbo, but um, I would have still learned everything. Well, that concludes our rundown on this episode. Let's jump to our music segment and talk about the uh, the music that was in this episode. 
So here we go. We're going to sum up the music that was in this, the fifth episode of season one, Miami Vice, Calderon's Return Part 2, or Calderon's Demise. We only have two songs that are in this episode. We technically have three. During the amazing tub sex scene, we have the quote-unquote tubs theme. And apparently that'll make that I'll make appearances here and there throughout the episode with <laughs> throughout the seasons. Hopefully that music is a trigger for you to know that a tub sex scene is coming and to fast forward. Unlike the, look people, away. unlike the people in the eighties <laughs> before DVRs existed. No wonder everyone came out of the eighties so messed up. <laughs> There's only two songs in this, and they're both they, they uh bookend the entire episode. We have in the very beginning yes. with the boat montage. The Voices by Russ Ballard. And then we have at the end, What's Love Got to Do With It by Tina Turner. I'm going to turn it over to you, John. You are a, our resident music expert. So the song Voices is our second song that they used off of Russ Ballard's self-titled album that he released in 1984. And it's actually they used them in back-to-back episodes. In, and so it's one of the more iconic scenes and it was actually used in back the, the scene, the montage scene with the song Voices was used in Back to the Future 3. And the cat it's playing in the cafe scene. Really? Uh, when they, uh, it, yeah, when they're back in the 1980s. I have, I have um, to say, so, that song was perfect for the scene. I don't know yes. who Russ Ballard is, but that song was perfect for that scene. It is. It, it it is. It was perfect for the scene, and that scene, and, and the, the that because that song is so perfect for the scene, and that scene kind of embraces what Miami Vice is so much that it was. That's why you know it was referenced in a movie. There It was referenced mm-hmm. in the remake movie later on in the uh, Colin Farrell Jamie Fox movie. Uh, they do a scene that was inspired by that scene with the song voices and even the Simpsons, when they do did their Miami vice intro spoof, which they aired. I, I want to say in the past season or two, it was very influenced by that voices montage scene. It's actually a very important song, even though it's not very, a very big song, uh, you know, years down, not looked at as a very big song as far as, uh, compared to what's love got to do with it from Tina Turner. Yeah, Which, we don't really need, you know, like everyone knows that song, right? That's not everyone knows that song and that is actually I was a little surprised to find out it's Tina Turner's only number 1 song on the Billboard Top 100. That's crazy to uh, me. was it is, isn't it? It is. I would have guessed that there would have been other ones, but yeah, it turns out that that is the only number 1 song she ever had. So that's pretty much all for the music as far as just the two both songs you know used for the montages and that in the montages were so long that they almost played the entire song which is like the only time that has ever happened in the series pretty much so a 40 you know 47 minute episode and about 10 minutes of it is just montage i'd say that's pretty good yeah well let's move on and close this episode out and give our rundown on our final thoughts so I'm going to start off this time with my final thoughts. You know, I mentioned last week about the hit list that the one of my favorite things about Miami Vice is as long as you pay attention to the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes, you can do whatever you want in the middle, but and you'll you'll be treated with great TV in the in that time frame. And I still stand by that statement that the as long as you can pay attention in the beginning and the end, you get what you need out of the episode. And if you get distracted in the middle, it's not that big a deal. What, I, what I'm starting to notice, though, is that you can be a fan of Miami Vice and just watch the beginning and end, and you, have, and, you, and you get a great experience. But the stuff that we're really after, the great stuff, happens in, the, in that middle section. And we meet great characters like Jimbo, the bartender. We meet them in the middle. And it feels like almost like the writers know or that the cast knows is that like, hey, it's tough to keep an audience for 47 minutes. So if there's some flubs or there's some story arcs that don't make any sense, like we just got to fill this time. And it is so great. And it's so hilarious. The stuff that they fill in the middle to make a full episode. 
the the beginning montage is excellent. It's, it's one of my favorite parts so far. Miami Vice. The end is excellent because it summarizes what the '80s is like. That they decided to end an episode with a montage about the episode you just watched. But the the middle is so great because we meet so many weird characters. We meet Angelina. We meet Jimbo. You know, there's the great scene of the car exploding in the ocean and then just flat disappearing. That makes me why I remind me of why I love watching this show. John, what are your final thoughts on this episode? So to touch on a little bit what you just talked about, you know, how you're saying the fun has really been in the middle where we're meeting these characters like Noogie and Jimbo. And I want to say that so far that has been my favorite part is these characters that really are just, you know, side characters in it. I've enjoyed Jimbo and Noogie way more than I've enjoyed Sonny and Crockett at up to this point. I love these little random characters that they're throwing in there with Sonny and Crockett, because I think I'm used to Sonny and Crockett at this point. I know what type of character I'm getting from them, you know, and I I, I enjoy laughing at some of the stuff they do, and I... I it, and I get most of the scenes, you know, uh, are focused on them, but I keep getting distracted by these other characters. And I am just, uh, I, I want a uh, noogie, want more Jimbo, you know, I want to meet more characters like this moving forward. Yep. Yep. Jenna, what are your closing thoughts on this? The second half of Calderon's return. Okay. Well, I think I've already talked enough about being clearly traumatized by the Rico uh, <laughs> as a suave, cool <laughs> character. Okay. But, but so that aside, um, one thing that I am really starting to get interested in is trying to pick up on the subtleties. I don't think that that's something that immediately comes to mind when you think about this show, that it's subtle at all because um, it, it tends to not be, but I have to believe, and I really want to believe that it, that it is that there's more happening here there's a lot like in that middle section like you were talking about there's a lot that happens and a lot of crap that they throw in there that i feel like like being a few episodes in like i'm definitely not picking up on everything that's going to become uh useful later so i'm interested to see how they use some of these storylines that are sort of uh partially introduced if you will uh, and whether or not those become more predominant or whatever uh, later on in the season or in other seasons. Mm -hmm. So that's going to do it for us this week on you know season one episode five Calderon's return. You know we uh, this I love this episode and this is you know as we as we all mentioned in our closing thoughts that you know this is why we've chosen this show. We have lots of announcements this week. First of all, the website our our website is ready to go. You can go check out our website, find out how to subscribe to the podcast or how to contact us at gowiththeheat.com. You can also email us at gowiththeheat at gmail.com. You got a question, you got a comment, you want to mention something to us, you can send us an email there. You can also get us on Twitter. I'm at Dom Corvo. Jenna is at Jenna A. Barham. And John is at Corvo underscore John. You can reach out to any of us on Twitter. We'd be happy to talk to you. You can also follow our official accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr that you can find an official Go With The Heat podcast accounts. And so if you want to get updates on when a show lands, we are publishing this show on Thursday. So it should hit your podcatcher on Thursdays and you can get a new episode for your ears. There's a ton of other information that you can find at our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Make sure to check it out. Subscribe and tell a friend about this, even if they've never watched Miami Vice, this is a chance that they can uh, find the greatness that is the cultural phenomenon that is Miami Vice. That's going to do it all for us this week. Be sure to come back next Thursday for our next episode and we'll talk to you then. Bye, pal. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>